orbital resonance. Just uh, been doing some studying about orbital resonance, and it's kind of interesting. It's very interesting, actually, because what it does is help you understand uh, the universe is not how they tell you it is. In their explanation of orbital resonance, they give you the example of Jupiter and three of its Galilean moons, Io the closest, Europa the second, and Ganymede the third, where they are orbiting in a specific velocity where they are actually aligning up with each other in very even integer numbers. One to one, two to one, four to one. So every four orbits of Io the fastest, the outermost Ganymede moon is going to do one full orbit. Or every two orbits that Io makes, Europa is going to make two orbits. And so this is called orbital resonance. And it's kind of interesting because, well, just go over their definitions first. In celestial mechanics, orbital resonance occurs when orbiting bodies exert a regular periodic gravitational influence on each other, usually because their orbital periods are related by a ratio of small integers. Most commonly, this relationship is found for a pair of objects. Physical, the physical principle behind orbit orbital resonance is similar in concept to pushing a child on a swing where the orbit and the swing both have a natural frequency and the orbit body and the other body doing the pushing will act in periodic repetition to have cumulative effect on the motion orbital resonances greatly enhance the mutual gravitation influence of the bodies i.e. their ability to alter or constrain each other's orbits okay so they're p playing off of each other, they're constraining, they're limiting each other, they're influencing each other to fall into a, partic a particular groove, I like to call it. And if, if they give the analogy of a, a swing, however, this is not a very good uh, example they give you. It's First of all, they're concluding that the Jupiter's moon's orbits are almost circular, they're slightly elliptical. They'll, you know, there's a small eccentricity to it that they, they will tell you. And I'm going to explain to you why that's uh, probably not the case. Uh, there's different types of orbital resonance between asteroids, other planets, and the, there's a very, very low probability that this is happening by chance. Uh, there's another thing called the Laplace resonance. So going back to the Jupiter moons, uh, Laplace is saying that uh, these three moons will never line up, and that's uh, somehow explained with his math. But going down here a little bit further, I want to get into the coincidental near ra ratios of mean motion. Uh, you, you've seen this before, right? The Earth-Venus. Well, actually, it's not the Earth-Venus because you're inside a concave station on Earth. It's actually Venus and the Sun. But they have an 8 to 13 near resonance. You know, every eight years. Um, and then Venus is going to make the pentagram in the sky. Um, this is a better explanation of what's really going on here with my animation of showing the pentagram of Venus, and I'll get to that later, why it's a better explanation. But going back here, I just want to go to this chart here. See, they have all these ratios and bodies. They have Venus-Mercury, uh, they have Earth-Venus, but it's actually Sun-Venus, uh, Mars-Venus, Mars-Sun, not Earth, Jupiter, all these different ratios. And if you look to the right here, they have a column that says probability and it's a very low number for all of these ratios. 0 0.19, 0 0.65, 0 0.68, you know, 0 0.78. And so what they're saying is that <laughs> this shouldn't be happening. <laughs> Why are we having this orbital resonance? It is, it's not probable. It's not, it can't, I mean, look at all these numbers here. Look at this one. I mean, they're so low. See, it says right here, the probability of obtaining an orbital coincidence of equal or smaller mismatch by chance, at least one in n attempts, where n is the integer number of orbits of the outer body per cycle and the mismatch 
is assumed to be to vary between 0 and 180 degrees at random. The value is calculated as 1 blah blah blah. The smaller the probability, the more remarkable the coincidence. So that small number here, I mean it's already small. I mean going back to what I've been telling you about the the precession myth, right? We have the Sun crossing the galactic equator in today's generation just happening to land on the solstice state. And that's a 0.54% chance. These are even lower chances. Okay, this is not this is this is not okay, this is not gonna fly. This is not a good explanation why we're having orbital resonance within a heliocentric model. It doesn't work, it's not intuitive. There's no form, there's no reason reason behind it. And so what I, I did, I, I looked into Jupiter, the moons of Jupiter here, and um, I had my own version of why this is happening. Well, first of all, if you understand my model, we actually have Jupiter and all the other planets. They are orbiting almost a sidereal day, you know, every day, because they're, they're, they're pretty much syncing up with the celestial sphere. As the celestial sphere ro rotates, orbits counterclockwise. It's in motion. Jupiter's in motion. All the other planets are in motion. And the moons around Jupiter are in motion as well. Now, going back to, let's go to the velocity of these moons. You know, Io, here, see, I, obviously you see my orbit here. I, I, I truncated it. I made it much more elliptical than, than what they're showing you. So Worldwide Telescope, I have it in my sky mode, and I have Jupiter right over there. And you just look at Jupiter, I mean, as you click the forward button, you fast forward it in time. You see how the planets, they do this little dance around it like that. Look a little bit faster. Zoom back out. And this is the ecliptic line, this, this blue dotted line here. But zooming back in, we see Jupiter, it's kind of like racing around like that. So, that's kind of interesting, right? It's going in retrograde right now. It's in motion. It really is. Jupiter's in motion. I mean, I'm not talking from a heliocentric point of view. I'm talking about within the concave Earth, it's doing like almost one revolution per day. Pretty close to the speed of the celestial sphere of a sidereal time. Jupiter. Here comes, here comes. So we have these moons. They're magnetically affecting, or being affected by Jupiter. Jupiter's attracting them. So if we go into Stellarium here, I want to show you what's also interesting, too, is I have one of the moons selected. It's Callisto. It's the outermost of the four Galilean moons. And it has, you know, the widest orbit. And so from a heliocentric point of view, they're going to tell you that it's per almost perfectly circular. You know, if you're looking top down on it, uh, but this is kind of interesting here. The the apparent diameter. See this number right here? It's at 1.3 arc seconds, and it's going to do an orbit every 17 days around Jupiter. I mean, that's another thing too. I mean, the velocity of these moons, if they are like hundreds of millions of miles away, and the orbits are like you know 10, 15 times uh, more than the orbit of the moon around the Earth, why are they going so much faster? You know, I was like 15 times faster than the moon, supposedly. I mean, not supposedly. That's that's how we observe it. The moon, if the moon does one orbit like every 27 point some odd days within the Earth. Actually, no, it's doing more. It's you know, like it's it's doing actually it's 24 hours and 50 minutes. But they're gonna tell you it's you know it's one lunar month around the Earth compared to these moons, which are supposedly. Uh, orbiting in a much wider orbit than our moon is. So why would, no, it's not reasonable to, it's more reasonable to believe that these moons are much more minuscule than our moon, and it's not a good comparison. And so if I just do one orbit of Callisto, watching that apparent diameter, 17 days, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, the apparent diameter has not changed. It's still at 1.3 arc seconds. So what I'm trying to help you understand is that 
it makes more sense if from back front to back uh, there's not much of a difference you understand there's not much more of a difference in in proximity <laughs> that's another reason to understand that these orbits are being truncated okay here's my my orbits I show how the, the orbital resonance is happening and Jupiter's in motion you understand there's actually drag that's causing these planets to elongate like that see space is not a vacuum despite what they tell you I mean it might be close to a vacuum but uh, it's not and so it's still gonna get some drag it's still gonna be uh, it's probably these planets are magnetically influenced by Jupiter and if Jupiter were to actually stop in the sky, like I talk about, when the sun stops, these moons would crash in. They would, they're just like, you know, waiting to, to crash into Jupiter. And I think Jupiter is a glass ball, probably about 500 feet wide. If that, oh, maybe 1,000 feet wide. I mean, we're talking minuscule here. And so I, if you look at the patterns, the swirl patterns on Jupiter, uh, I made a video about that before, how I compared uh, in fluid dynamics how we have those long filamentary streaks indicating that it's um, it's rotating. But if you understand that, I mean, why are we viewing that on the surface? I mean, gravity is fictitious. It's more likely that this is a container filled with liquid, a vial filled with liquid, and the liquid uh, is going to the inner concave walls due to centrifugal force. And so, as these moons rotate around Jupiter, uh, they're being pulled toward it, but also there's a temperature fluctuation, I believe, that the top would be toward Earth, and the bottom would be toward the celestial sphere. So, um, let me go to this one here. So, we're, look, we're looking top down, okay? We're inside the Earth. There's a ball of stars in the center. And so, Jupiter's going to be, you know, inside this inner glass, as well as the Sun. And the sunlight is going to be bending around, and it always returns. So it hits the celestial sphere perpendicularly. The sunlight is always returning. And so, going back here, uh, sunlight is returning to the celestial sphere. And so, from ground, we're not going to see, you know, we're not going to see the, uh, the front-back uh, relation or angle of how we see these moons. So we're always going to be looking at it. From, um, from in this window here from top down so uh, you're not going to be able to detect you're not going to see that and plus we when we do observe Jupiter and the moons we see how it stretches out it goes you know it goes wide like that and so if this is happening like this this is a good reason to understand why we're having orbital resonance in the first place is because it's creating more uh, what I call pendulum wells you know they're, they're creases are like their beginnings and endings and so these pendulum wells <clears throat> are like checkpoints for the orbiting bodies to kind of like check in with and you know and so they fall into the, these grooves and that's what it's really all about having these elongated uh, truncated highly elliptical orbits around planets or if you're you know if you're just a planet without any moons uh, you're, you're experiencing experiencing retrograde motion and that's uh, how I, I believe that Venus is actually doing that see Venus has these wells as well you know see how it's it's uh, it's changing direction when the retrograde happens it has these sharp corners and so that's creating a resonance as well with the Sun and so same thing with all the other planets it's because we're in a confined closed system with orbiting bodies especially the Sun that has a very regular repetitive pattern and so it's creating uh, resonances where the other orbiting bodies within are falling into their appropriate uh, paths or pockets or grooves uh, and also being affected by neighboring orbital bodies uh, in a, in a, a play relationship a push-pull relationship where they're exhibiting this orbital resonance and that's why it's happening it can only happen like this you know that's why the heliocentric model it just can't happen like that so that's what we have here you know they they say that uh, these Jupiter's moons uh, will have tidal locking like our moon supposedly does that's how they say that why we only see the same side of the moon 
all the time. Well, they don't realize that the moon is actually just a half of a sphere. And it's, it's kind of like a cup where the, you know, the bottom of the cup is always facing Earth and we always see the front of the moon, but um, that's why that's happening. But I think they, well, they have to use pho a method called photometry to uh, actually view, and it's just like viewing the light, you know, the different values of the light on the moon because it's like you're looking through glass here. I, I've already explained before how you're still going to get chromatic aberration when looking at these moons of Jupiter through a normal reflecting telescope. And so that's a good indication because reflecting telescopes are supposed to eradicate chromatic aberration, but you're still picking it up. And so you're looking at them through glass. And, um, but with it, they try to, you know, heliocentrism is basically the attempt and try to um, make Earth and its, you know, neighboring moon not that special. And so if they can, like, correlate it with other moons and say, oh, we have tidal locking here with Jupiter's moons as well, uh, the more they can take out of this out of the system like they do so well uh, but um, lately they had discovered that uh, some of their initial uh, conclusions about tidal locking with the moons is actually with the moons of Jupiter is actually uh, not quite uh, the story uh, they're, they're finding out that Europa it appears there might be some dispute on Europa's tidal locking status and so they go on to saying, well, it, it could be flexing. It, I think they call it tidal flexing. And so, and that's, that could be possible. If these planets are actually magnetically attracted to Jupiter and they're in this uh, constant state of momentum where they're moving, and like over here, see how it's moving? Okay, so it's creating this drag, it's movement. Uh, they could be having this, this you know, due to the centri centripetal force at play as they're going toward the west, toward the left here, um, they could be turning more and they could be flexing like that. And um, they even, even Mr. Neil deGrasse, he said that Io experiences, a, it's not a constant velocity orbit, it speeds up it gets, as it gets closer to Jupiter. So that's another indication too, that there's a magnetic pull as well. And so this makes much more sense if you understand how, you know, pendulums, harmonic pendulums. I got a video about that. Harmonic pendulum. You've seen these before, right? When he, when he lets go and they do that little dance. That's very similar how I see orbital resonance happening. But when they give you the analogy of the swing, it doesn't make sense in a circular orbit. Like if it, this is an animation of somebody, somebody did of a harmonic pendulum but looking top down you see this you know it's just going back and forth so the more elliptical or elongated your orbit is as opposed to being circular right like they'll show you the circular bullshit sorry for swearing I know that there's just children watching but the more that orbit is going to be you know back and forth like a swing I mean that makes more sense this is a swing this is not a swing <laughs> so you have these wells you have these pendulum wells you have an acceleration deceleration but you have a reversal in direction and you have this orbital resonance happening so the more you can get an orbit you know thinner like that basically the more orbital resonance you're going to have especially if they're affected by their neighboring bodies in some form of magnetic attraction. And so you have all these all these relationships, all these ratios going on here. You know? Io Europa, 2 to 1. Io Ganymede, 4 to 1. Ganymede Europa, you know, 1 half to 1. So that's what's happening makes much more sense it's much more fluid it's much more intuitive it's it's real it's the truth I mean there's, there's I mean you have this Jupiter trekking through space you know it's 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 trekking through space it's moving you have momentum you have movement and so much more intuitive to understand that's why we have resonance at play. And this is another, I mean, just add it to the list of the happy coincidences, right? 
Happy coincidence the sun and the moon appear the same size in the sky. I keep stressing that. Be you know, what are the odds? I, I don't even know where to begin to calculate the odds of that happening. A billion to one? A trillion to one? And then, of course, the odds of how I said the, the sun passing through the, uh, the galactic equator during the solstice in, in this generation. It's, it's less than half of, of a percent. And then you have all these happy coincidences with orbital resonance. Highly improbable. It just does not compute. So there's no rationality. It's unreasonable to believe in the heliocentric model. Totally unreasonable. I don't even know why I have to uh, <laughs> tell you this. It's just because you've been indoctrinated and brainwashed. It's all about uh, pop populist consensus opinion. And so... That's what you guys need to know, okay? If you can take anything from this video, understand that orbital resonance is happening because these orbits are highly elliptical, highly, I mean, more than they will tell you. And they have these pendulum wells that cause it to go in the other direction and that uh, 